Pues también es lo que es muy especial en esta montaña. Uh, es sí que viene con alguna característica. Aquí se empezaba en Rusia, pero se terminó en Rusia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming. And uh, uh, I also, I, I did this since uh, uh, Dean Zarapa Gauda is here. I thank you profusely <laughs> for uh, making this uh, visit possible uh, in my first lecture. Uh, so I want to take the occasion to reiterate this. Thank you again. So, uh, uh, well, this is the title. So, uh, obstacle problems play an ambiguous uh, role in the applied sciences uh, uh, as uh, seemingly different phenomena can be expressed in terms of problems of obstacle of type and the applications are very wide. I mean, uh, I will just list a few of them. Linear elasticity, this is really well expected. I will uh, make it clear uh, uh, as I go down into my lecture. Uh, fluid dynamics, uh, robotics is another uh, uh, field where uh, obstacle problem arise, as you can imagine, the motion of arms of a robot, you know, are, uh, uh, can be mathematically translated into uh, obstacle problems, specifically of lower dimension. So temperature control, uh, financial mathematics, and so and so forth. There are many, many uh, situations in which an obstacle problem essentially is a variational inequality, and I'll, I'll describe this uh, uh, setting uh, uh, in, in more detail. So in this lecture, I will start with an overview of lower dimensional or signorini type obstacle problems, and then present some uh, recent results on parabolic obstacle problems in uh, which are uh, contained in some joint work with uh, Agnid, Donatella Danielli, and Ashak Petrosian. And in particular, I will try to highlight, uh, hopefully, I don't plan to give any proof, but it will get a little bit technical toward the end of my lecture, and that's unavoidable because I have to list the results, and they look technical. So I will uh, hopefully, the first part of my talk will uh, motivate sufficiently uh, uh, the second part of my talk. So uh, monotonicity properties, they play a special role in analysis, geometry, and not only and uh, they lead to a remarkable insight into the nature of uh, the relevant equations that one is studying. Uh, uh, this, is this me beeping or? Uh, okay. <coughs> so uh, prominently in blow up analysis of solutions for the problem at hand. So but let me start with the prelude, the classical obstacle problem. So now I'll start moving a little bit fast because otherwise uh, uh, I won't get to the end of my talk. So consider the problem. So you have an open set, omega in Rn, and two smooth functions. This is in red is the obstacle. And uh, there is a boundary datum. And of course, the condition for the existence of a solution is that the boundary datum exceeds the obstacle on the boundary of your domain. So that the picture looks like this. So this is the picture that uh, you may want to keep in mind. So yeah, this is the obstacle. And uh, the boundary datum is like this. So on the boundary, the obstacle is below the boundary datum. And the, the reason for which you want that condition is that you want this set to be a convex set. <coughs> so once this set is a convex set, then you invoke a standard result from uh, functional analysis, variational inequalities, and uh, you realize that minimizing this uh, functional here on this closed convex set is equivalent to uh, requesting this variational inequality. And so this has to be true for all functions phi. So these are the test functions in your convex set. And you want to find a function u in the convex set for which this is true. So one thing that you realize immediately from the inequality is that uh, when you look at the set where u is above the obstacle, so u is going to be your solution. Above the obstacle means uh, that you are separated from the obstacle, and then your function u is just a standard harmonic function. It's a classical harmonic function. 
but on the whole set, uh, u is a super harmonic function. And there is a classical theorem in potential theory by Evans and Basilescu that goes back to 1935 that says that u is continuous. So your solution is not only a function in the Sobolev space W12, but it's a continuous function. Once you know it's a continuous function, then this set is an open set. Okay, and that's an important information to start the analysis. So the picture looks like this. Okay, so this, uh, uh, this is the obstacle, psi, and you have uh, the solution U, it's, uh, it which attaches to this membrane on a subset of your domain omega. So this subset lambda is what I will call the coincidence set, the set where U touches the obstacle, and the topological boundary of the coincidence set is what uh, is known as the free boundary. And the main issue in these problems is that a priori you don't know what the free boundary is. So finding the free boundary is part of the problem. So the unknowns here are you, the solution to the problem, and the free boundary. And once you uh, have this in mind, then there are two fundamental questions which arise. The first one is what is the optimal smoothness of the solution? We know that harmonic functions are uh, smooth, but in fact they are real analytic. Uh, how smooth is the solution of the obstacle problem? Well, of course, away from the coincidence set, it's an harmonic function, so it's very smooth. But across the free boundary, as you will see in a moment, there is uh, something that happens. So there are two questions. What is the optimal smoothness of the solution, and how smooth is the free boundary? Now, the first question was answered back in 1972, uh, pioneering paper by Fraser, he showed that, that uh, uh, solution is C11. C11 means two derivatives in L infinity, if I use rademacher stefanov theorem. So this means that uh, uh, the second derivatives are only bounded, but they are not necessarily continuous. And this is quite obvious, because uh, when you look at the coincidence set, on the coincidence set, the Laplacian of U coincides with the Laplacian of the obstacle away from the coincidence set, the Laplacian of U is zero. So there is a discontinuity in the Laplacian. So second derivatives are bounded, but not necessarily continuous. So uh, this settles the question of uh, best possible uh, smoothness inside of the solution. The uh, question number two instead is much more involved. Okay, so let me give you uh, uh, a little bit of the history of how things went. So in 1977, Kinderler and Nirenberg proved a remarkable fact. They showed that if the obstacle is real analytic, and if one knows a priori that near the free boundary, so near a point of the free boundary, the solution U is C2 up to the uh, free boundary. So, but this does not mean across. It means just from one side. Then, uh, if you know a priori that the free boundary near x0 is, is a C1 hypersurface, in fact, it's a real analytic hypersurface. Wow, the free boundary smooths out. So this is a major uh, result by Kinderlehrer and Nirenberg. And then the question obviously arises, is it always true generically that in a neighborhood of one of these points, uh, the free boundary is a C1 hypersurface? And the answer is negative. This was proved by David Shepard in 1977. He gave examples of free boundary with cusp-like or pinched bottleneck free boundary points. So the picture looks like this. So these are two very bad points for the free boundary. All right, so the subtle reason for this state of affairs is in the distinction between uh, two types of free boundary points, regular and singular. So if now I'll give the definition and you will see what goes on. So a free boundary point is called regular. If there exists a small radius such that nearby uh, that point uh, within that radius, U uh, detaches itself from the, free, from the obstacle and most with a quadratic rate. And this quadratic rate is optimal in the obstacle problem. So for instance, look at this function. This function, one half positive part of xn squared. This is a typical example of a function which is C11 and it's not C2, okay? So we would give this in a calculus course. 
So, but uh, this function here is a global solution of the obstacle problem corresponding to obstacle uh, psi equal to zero. Uh, let's look at the coincidence set. The coincidence set is uh, the half space, xn less than or equal to zero. So the boundary of the coincidence set is the hyperplane xn equals zero, and it's clear that uh, in a neighborhood of any point of this hyperplane, the solution is quadratic, so the supremum between u and zero is precisely r squared in every ball centered at that point. So all free boundary points in this example are regular free boundary points. However, there is uh, uh, another issue lurking in the background, and so let me give the second definition now. A free boundary point is called singular if the coincidence set has vanishing and dimensional Lebesgue density at x0. So this means that if you take the measure of uh, uh, the, <coughs> coincidence, uh, the, the, the coincidence set intersected with the ball centered at your free boundary point divided by the volume of the ball, which we all know is r to the n, so this limit must be zero. If that happens, and of course this happens in the situation in which you have a cusp or a bottleneck, a, a, a pinched bottleneck, okay, then you call the free boundary uh, a singular free point, you call it a singular free boundary point. Now, you, you may think, well, okay, these points must be very few, exceptional, not true. You can have an obstacle problem in which uh, all three boundary points are singular. So you have to deal with these points. You cannot overlook them. So let me give you a very simple example. Uh, look at this example. It's just a manipulation, a simple manipulation of the example I gave you before. Before I gave you the positive part of xn squared. Now I'm giving you xn squared. This is again a global solution to obstacle problem with zero obstacle, but now the coincidence set is very thin, is an hyperplane. And so uh, all three boundary points have zero density. If you take the intersection of this guy now with the ball, you get uh, <coughs> Rn minus one. Downstairs, uh, you get Rn. So this, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so you get, uh, uh, that's correct. So, so you get the limit is zero. So all three boundary points have zero density now. And so therefore, uh, uh, you have to deal with this problem. Now, in the classical, since these two definitions, the one I gave you before of regular point and the one I'm giving you now, singular point, are mutually exclusive, in the obstacle problem, there are only two types of problem, of point, either regular or singular. Good. So at least we know what is the enemy that we need to face. So, and now let me go to, uh, again, year 1977, the celebrated paper work of Luis Caffarelli in Acta Mathematica. He proved uh, a, a, a fundamental result. He showed that if at the point x0, free boundary point, uh, so that point is of positive density for the coincidence set, and therefore it must be a regular point, because remember, if it, if it either has positive density or zero density. If it has positive density, it must be regular. You can show, you can prove this uh, according to the definition I gave you before. So it has to detach from the obstacle quadratically. So uh, suppose that in that neighborhood, you, uh, you know, uh, the, the free boundary is a C1 hypersurface and the solution is uh, C2. So you prove, he proved that in that neighborhood, so under this condition, the free boundary is a C1 hypersurface, and the solution is C2 up to the free boundary. So you arrive C2 from inside, okay? So if you combine this result with Kinderler and Nirenberg theorem that uh, uh, appeared in the same year, you end up proving a remarkable fact that at any regular point, the free boundary must be real analytic. Okay, so we know everything about the regular free boundary. We know the best possible information. So this completely settles the question of the regularity of the free boundary at regular free boundary points, but leaves it completely open at singular free boundary points. So uh, at this point, it's important that I mention that uh, 22 years after Caffarelli's uh, groundbreaking work, George Weiss, precisely in 1999, Inventiones Mathematische, he developed an alternative method for proving that the regular point 
the free boundary is locally a C1 alpha hypersurface. This approach was based on a new monotonicity formula, which has been since named the Weiss monotonicity formula. And uh, this monotonicity formula was combined by him by, by, uh, with uh, a new epiperimetric inequality. So this is an inequality that comes from geometric measure theory, essentially. And uh, we will see the circle of ideas reappear later in this lecture. So th the reason for which I mentioned Weiss at this junction is because uh, this Weiss monotonicity formula was used many years later by Regis Monod in 2003 to establish yet another monotonicity formula at singular free boundary point. With this new monotonicity formula, Monod was finally able in 2003 to show uh, the regularity of the free boundary at, regular free bo at singular free boundary point. And he essentially showed that uh, uh, nearby a singular point, the free boundary is, has a C1 stratification. So it's a countable union of C1 hypersurfaces. OK, so that's uh, the prehistory. And now I will uh, move um, closer to the main subject of my lecture. So obstacle problem for non-local operators. So in the, I would say, probably past uh, mm, 13 years, there has been an explosion of interest in this, this kind of problems. And you will see in a moment, uh, uh, you know, I will uh, mention the paper that uh, originated this uh, interest. But anyhow, so uh, let me consider now the fractional Laplacian. So this operator, I have already mentioned uh, it uh, in uh, my past lectures, but uh, you can think of it uh, using uh, Marcel Ries uh, definition, which dates back to 1937. So the fractional Laplacian, uh, you have uh, a universal constant here that uh, depends only on N and S, and then here you can write uh, Fx minus Sy divided by X minus Y to the N plus T S dy. So this is a non-local operator. It's defined to an integral. So it does not take into account only value of the function near the point, but it takes into account value of the function everywhere. This integral is not convergent always, unless you impose very strict conditions on f. So we have to take it into uh, the Cauchy principal value sense as a limit. So that's the definition of uh, fractional Laplacian. And uh, uh, so this fractional Laplacian was introduced in uh, 1937 by Marcel Ries. <coughs> so uh, the basic Hamiltonian model of the uh, non-local obstacle problem is this one. So you want, uh, so again, psi is going to be your obstacle. This psi is going to be defined on all of space now because you have non-local operator. And you're minimizing uh, the, the between u minus psi and uh, minus Laplacian S of u. S is a number between 0 and 1. And I will show you where these problems come from in a moment. So, and you want this minimum to be 0. And then uh, you need to impose some uniqueness condition. So you want u to go to 0 at infinity. <coughs> so function psi is the obstacle. Again, you call the coincident set the set where u coincides with the obstacle. And you call the free boundary the topological boundary of the coincident set. So this problem uh, uh, arises in elasticity. In fact, the first time this problem came about was in 1959 in a, a beautiful lecture of Antonio Signorini. So the problem of Signorini asks, what is the equilibrium configuration of a spherically shaped elastic body that rests on a rigid frictionless plane? And I'll show you a picture. So another prominent uh, area in which these problems arise is probability and mass finance, optimal stopping problems for stochastic processes with jumps. Stochastic processes with jumps are connected to the fractional power of the Laplacian. <coughs> uh, geophysical fluid dynamics, quasi-geostrophic equations, and there are many, many other subjects. Uh, uh, fluid dynamics also uh, is, uh, well, uh, I'll, show, I'll show you also some 
uh, examples as uh, we go along. So the birth of variational inequalities as we presently know them dates back to 1959 with a problem in linear elasticity first proposed by Antonio Signorini. So uh, Signorini formulated this question. He wanted to find the equilibrium configuration of an isotropic non-homogeneous elastic body that rests on a rigid friction sur frictionless surface and is subject only to its mass forces. So the e existence of uniqueness of the solution for this problem was proved by Gaetano Ficera in 1963 after he attended as a student the lecture of Signorini which he formulated the problem. So uh, that's an incentive for young people uh, to listen carefully to what uh, uh, your older professors say because uh, it could be a good occasion uh, to uh, make a crack into a very interesting problem. So uh, Signorini problem is a lower dimensional optical problem and uh, uh, you don't see it in this formulation of course in this Hamiltonian formulation I'm talking about, this just looks like a classical obstacle problem for, uh, for the fractional powers of the Laplacian, but you will see soon that that problem is equivalent to a lower dimensional obstacle problem. So in fact, uh, it's uh, equivalent to a lower dimensional obstacle problem for minus Laplacian to the power one half. And so here is a picture, uh, you know, you have uh, a body here and uh, it's at rest and uh, it's uh, subject only to its mass forces and you're asking uh, what is the equilibrium configuration. So, <coughs> so here is at our man at work. This is Antonio Signorini. Uh, I, I cannot swear that it was during the lecture in which he formulated the problem, but probably it's very close, uh, judging from his uh, very formal attire. I don't think that today anybody would uh, lecture anymore in this uh, super formal attire. Uh, and uh, so, he, he, by the way, he, uh, he was born in 1888 and died uh, in the same year in which, in fact, he died a few, few days before, uh, lay, uh, after Fiquera solved the problem. And on his deathbed, he said that Fiquera gave him uh, the biggest joy of his life. Of course, Signorini was not married because if he had a wife, that uh, statement would have been very, very dangerous, as you can imagine. Uh, so uh, and he was a student of uh, two big guys in Italy, the two uh, the Italian geometers, Luigi Bianchi and Tullio Levi Civita. <coughs> but he was a, an engineer, mainly, who knew a lot of math. So in 2007, uh, Caffarelli and Sylvester introduced a remarkable extension procedure. I have already mentioned this procedure in my previous talks. And this procedure allows to convert the problem of Signorini into, uh, <coughs> and more general problems involving non-local Laplacian into uh, a lower dimensional problem, uh, so obstacle problem. So let me describe quickly the, the setup here. So I will consider, uh, I, I start with this problem, this one, okay? So I'm in Rn. Now I'm gonna add the fake variable. So I'm gonna consider Rn plus one plus, and I'm gonna call that variable uh, y. So I'm sorry, I hope that there is no confusion. X runs in Rn, y runs in R plus. So we are in one dimension up and I will denote the running point by capital X. So for a given function U in the domain of the fractional Laplacian, let's consider the function capital U that solves this boundary value problem of Dirichlet type. So I'm considering this degenerate elliptic operator. Notice that this is the distance uh, of the point. It's, it's uh, better I, I draw a picture. So we have Rn here. So we have uh, y variable here. Sorry if this is not orthogonal. So <coughs> uh, if I take a point here, then uh, the distance of this point to the boundary now of this upper half space is just uh, y. So y to the a, uh, a is any number between uh, uh, minus one and one because uh, notice that uh, A is connected to S 
by this equation. S ranges between 0 and 1. So A now is going to range between minus 1 and 1. Okay? So this power can become a negative power. So that it could be a singular weight. But in any case, you solve this problem. There is a way of solving this problem by standard functional analysis. And uh, once you solve this problem, then uh, uh, there is a remarkable fact. Uh, there is this Dirichlet to Neumann relation that was proved by Caffarelli and Sylvester. So if you take the, the, normal, the normal derivative of capital U and you multiply by this weight and you go to the limit as y uh, goes to zero, up to numbers, uh, there is an explicit constant here, gamma is Euler's gamma function, you recover the fractional Laplacian of little u, so of the Dirichlet dative. Okay, so uh, now if you go back to the formulation, the Hamiltonian formulation, I gave you the obstacle problem, you see that uh, you know, you're requesting the minimum to be zero, so u minus psi, which has to be bigger than or equal than the minimum, is always bigger than or equal than zero, minus Laplacian of u is bigger than or equal than zero, this means that u is super harmonic in all space, that u has to be above the obstacle, and then, moreover, you have this condition here, okay? So these three conditions here, they are an equivalent reformulation of the minimum problem on the Hamiltonian side that I wrote before. And then you see that now, if you compare the fact that little u is the Dirichlet datum of capital U, then you see that capital U now solves this problem here. So you have uh, this equal to zero in Rn plus one plus, u on the thin set, so this is the thin set, y is equal to zero, capital U has to be bigger than or equal than the obstacle, this because on the thin set capital U is little u, the Neumann condition has to be bigger than or equal than zero, why? Because this is bigger than or equal than zero, and remember that this, you see, minus this, is equal to this. So since this is bigger than or equal than zero, so then uh, minus this limit has to be bigger than or equal than zero. So it's the condition that appears here. And this is precisely the Signorini condition. So these two things are the two Signorini condition. At every point, either this or this one will be satisfied. And uh, you see that when u is above the obstacle, then you get just zero for the limit. But when u is on the coincidence set, now the obstacle, psi, lives in the thin set, so on the boundary of the domain. That's why I call it a lower dimensional obstacle problem, okay? Because now the obstacle is no longer on the whole set, but it's on a codimension one manifold of this set. So, all right, so I've already said this thing, and this is a picture, so now this in uh, this picture here, you can think of m as uh, y equal to zero, okay? So you have a separating manifold that divides this open set into parts, d plus and d minus. The obstacle phi lives on this uh, uh, manifold here, and the function u has to attach itself to this obstacle on this separating manifold somewhere. So little history of the problem. <coughs> Uh, 1979, Annali di Pisa, Caffarelli shows the C1 alpha regularity of the solution for some alpha. Now, uh, this is not optimal, as we will see very quickly. Uh, in uh, 2004, there is a major breakthrough in the case in which S is equal one half. Atanasopoulos and Caffarelli proved that uh, uh, the solution inside is at best C1 one half, and this result is optimal because uh, uh, the Signorini problem, when S is equal to one half, as uh, for instance, uh, if you take the real part of X1 plus I Xn, so X, uh, all right, so. So I'm looking at uh, this separating manifold, M now, and this is the Xn axis, so to the three halves. So this function here, U of X, is a solution of uh, the Signorini problem corresponding to zero obstacle, 
And you see that this function, look at this power, three halves. If you take a derivative, that derivative is going to be elder continuous of uh, uh, order one half. So C one one half means that uh, the derivatives uh, are elder continuous of order one half. And this C one one half interior regularity is best possible, as this example shows. In 2008, Atanasopoulos, Caffarelli, and Sass introduced a beautiful new idea into the problem, so still in the case S equal one half. They introduce uh, this Amgren monotonicity formula, which I will describe in detail in a moment. And they prove uh, some uh, fine properties of the free boundary. So they show that the regular free boundary is locally a C1 manifold of dimension n minus 2. So remember that the free boundary is a subset of a co-dimension 1 manifold. So in its best possible case, it can be a, a a smooth surface of co-dimension 2. So in 2007, this is his PhD thesis, uh, uh, Sylvester proves that uh, uh, there is almost optimal regularity for solution for general S. So he shows that U is in C1 alpha for any alpha less than S. But uh, 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 the conjecture sharp regularity would be C1S. And uh, when S is one half, we would recover the atanasopoulos caffarelli optimal uh, interior regularity written here. In 2008, Caffarelli, Salsa, and Sylvester, Inventiones Mathematiche, they proved that uh, uh, there is optimal regularity C1S of the solution and C1 alpha smoothness of the regular part of the free boundary. And of course, now I haven't told you what the regular part of the free boundary, uh, <coughs> but I will in a, a moment. And then uh, in a joint work with Ar Arshak Petrosian in 2009, we, uh, we characterized for the first time the singular set in the case S equal one half. And we introduced uh, two new one parameter families of monotonicity formula of vice and mono type. And with these two formulas, uh, we were able to develop uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, regularity part of the singular part of the free boundary. In 2014, the Silva and Savin showed that uh, the higher regularity of the free boundary. So they show that the regular part of the free boundary starts sm smoothing out. Remember the original uh, uh, result of Kinderlehrer and Nirenberg, 1977. If it is C1, then becomes real analytic. So the Silva and Savin show that uh, the regular part of the free boundary, which we already know from the Atanasopoulos Caffarelli salsa, uh, uh, result that is uh, uh, C1 alpha hypersurface of codimension 2 now becomes C infinity. And then uh, uh, in 2014, at the same time, uh, Koch, Petrosian, and Xi, they prove that uh, the free boundary is in fact real analytic. analytic. So they, they prove the analog for this lower dimensional free boundary problems of the Kinderlehrer uh, Nirenberg uh, theorem. All right. Uh, so, uh, similarly to the classical obstacle problem, uh, in the lower dimensional one, the analysis of the free boundary revolves around the behavior of the so-called blow-ups. So, what are these blow-ups? So, in the Signorini problem, uh, S equal one half, Atasanasopoulos, Caffarelli, and Sassa introduced this non-homogeneous sound grand rescalings. So normally, in the classical problem, in the classical obstacle problem, you rescale quadratically. So you define, you take a solution to your problem and you look at this uh, quantity here, R squared. And that quadratic behavior is justified by the fact that, uh, you know, the solution is supposed to move quadratically away from the free boundary, at least a regular point. And this is the only thing that uh, you need to look at. In this uh, Signorini problem, instead, the situation is very, very, m is incredibly more complicated by lots of uh, possible homogeneity that are lurking, lurking in the background. So you have an infinity of homogeneities that can present themselves into the problem. In the classical obstacle problem, there is one single homogeneity, the quadratic one. So Atanasopoulos and Caffarelli and Salsa, they introduce this very strange object. They take URX, as I'm doing here, but then instead of dividing by R squared, they are dividing for by the L2 norm on a 
ball of radius r normalized, okay, appropriately. So they take the L2 average of a function on a ball of radius r and they call them uh, rescaling. Uh, and then they study the limit as r goes to zero. So they do a, a blow up analysis of this guy here. And uh, <coughs> uh, gener in general, when you look at these quantities here, not nothing tells you a priori that if you take uh, different subsequences going to zero of r, you go to the same limit. So you need something to control this process. And what uh, Atanasopoulos, Caffarelli, and Salsa realized is that the correct tool to control this uh, limiting process is the so-called Amgren's frequency function. And it's a very innocent looking quantity. So you take a function nu and uh, uh, Amgren introduced this quantity in 1979 in his uh, uh, fundamental study of minimal currents, of the regularity of minimal currents. And so he showed that if you have uh, an harmonic function nu, and you take r times uh, the energy of u on a ball of radius r, and you divide by uh, the height function, so the integral on the boundary of the ball, of so this quantity is mono monotonically increasing. As a function of r, this increases. Okay, so uh, <coughs> I would not suggest that you give this as a, a calculus exercise, but uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing to think about once you know the theorem. And moreover, you can check that for harmonic function, this quantity is identically constant, if and only if the function is homogeneous of degree kappa. So this frequency takes the name from the fact that if you take, I mean, it, it, it is quite obvious. And let me show you why. So uh, u is harmonic. So gradient u uh, on a ball of radius r by the divergence theorem uh, and the equation is equal to u, u nu on the boundary. I've used the equation and the divergence theorem. So once you have this, so you see here, now if uh, u is homogeneous of degree kappa, then we know by Euler's formula that uh, this is true. And so if you divide by this here and multiply by this, so you see that uh, this thing here is going to give you <coughs> the Neumann, the this Neumann derivative here. And so what you end up doing is that you get this same kind of perfect information. You see, this is equal to K U, kappa U. So you have U, and you get another kappa U from here, divided by R, because I have divided R to R. So you get uh, this thing here. Now, if you call this Vr, and you call this thing, say, kappa R goes to R, so you turn the recipe around, you see that R Vr divided by homogeneous of degree kappa, right? Okay, but the interesting thing is to show that if that thing is constant, then you have to be constant. And uh, <coughs> this is uh, the term of a probability that you get from this quantity. Well now, so there is this thing that I'm going to be discussing in a few minutes. It's a formula Fermi property here, so this is the Fermi factor, 
realize the difference from what you believe. The reporter said to them, Can you see the difference between the two sides? And now I'm using the monopolistic object of my thinking to ask this question of the second one, the difference of the second two. Now, the topic of my thinking, I have started by Nietzsche and I have discussed a little bit from Freud. At the end of this discussion, I ask, Is my thinking because this is my thinking that is not controlled by the monopoly? So I say, uh, now I can use the fantastic example of Nietzsche to say that uh, this happened uh, so often that the fantastic part took place in the cabaret in the fantastic world. He said that this happened in the world of the fantastic world because of the hero and because he has no possibility of control with the law. And uh, moreover, this law of absolution has to be a fantastic law because it has to be a fantastic law. But uh, Kafka is the main exception to this law of freedom because he has to see the conditions of the law of absolute freedom. So he gets this uh, now uh, insight from this discussion from a philosopher called Philip Ulrich Berger. In the Figurini Project, there is a minimal amount of freedom in the Figurini Project. In order to get the full power, For the freedom, the limited freedom that you have to be given to you. So the point at which you can be free or at which you can make your own decision is the point at which you have to accept the limitation. So the point at which you have to give up the power to the other is the logical point. So in the classical optics of Plato, he believed in two systems in the optics of quadratic maps. Now he says in the Figurini project he believes in the vector, in this system that he says in the classical optics of Plato, he believes in the quadratic maps. And the point at which the map is the point of inertia. So if you make a mistake, you are asking the map to be removed. So the law of classical optics of Plato is the law of the removal of the map from the map. The point at which the total freedom is, so there are no other systems in which you can have freedom. The fantastical freedom is only a system in which you have to give up the power to the other. So the fantastical society is a group that uh, has uh, this freedom as a minimal quality and has to serve the limitation of the freedom in order to be free. So this point of inertia is the point at which the total freedom is the point of inertia. So I said to this philosopher called Berger, this is a good way to start to discuss the freedom